Hi everyone and welcome to the next video on the Candidates Tournament 2011. After an amazing day of tiebreaks on Monday, the field has now been whittled down to two. In the standard time controls for the semi-finals, there were eight draws between the four players. After that came the rapid matches, where Kramnik and Grishuk were inseparable, and four draws followed, with Grishuk happy to take very short draws with the white pieces in order to take the match to the blitz stage. He completely outplayed Kramnik in the first game, and in the second even sacrificed a winning position to take the game into an easily drawing endgame, thus ensuring his qualification into the final of the tournament. On the other board, Kamsky played excellently against Gelfand in the rapid games. The first two were draws, but with the black pieces in the third, he set up some great traps, ultimately winning Gelfand's queen for a rook. So in the fourth rapid game, Gelfand was forced to play for a win, in order to stay in the tournament. Employing the Sicilian, he put up a great fight, although Kamsky missed some chances. The pressure was clearly affecting both players, but in the end it was Gelfand who won the game, taking their match two to the blitz stages. Having needed only a draw to qualify, Kamsky was clearly losing his cool, whereas the momentum was with Gelfand, who won the first two blitz games in a row, gaining immediate qualification to the final, where he will play Grishuk. It's an amazing pair to have made the final, and one that practically nobody would have put their money on at the start of the tournament. Kamsky was evidently devastated at the press conference afterwards. Of the games played in standard time controls, I thought this one was the best. It was the third game played between Kamsky with White and Gelfand. Kamsky opened with e4, to which Gelfand answered c5. The Sicilian, which he has used predominantly against e4 in this tournament, is great to see because he's also a noted Petrov player, which is an incredibly dull opening in comparison. Play continued into the main line Neidorf with knight f3, d6, d4, c takes d4, knight takes d4, knight f6, knight c3, and a6. And Kamsky continued with bishop e3, which is the most popular and fashionable way to play against the Sicilian at the moment. Bishop g5 and bishop c4 are major alternatives amongst others. Gelfand now struck out with e5, which is a common move in the Sicilian and typically double-edged. Black gains space with tempo, but at the cost of the d5 square, which is now weakened permanently. So knight b3, bishop e7, and h3, which was quite a surprise for Gelfand, who's a Sicilian expert. And this ensures that there's no knight g4 to harass the bishop and gets the pawn storm underway immediately, as Kamsky is intending to castle queenside. So bishop e6, defending the crucial d5 square, and now queen f3 from Kamsky, which enables long castling soon, and uh, gets ready for kingside attacking ideas with the queen, as well as maintaining the d5 grip, and keeping an eye on the e4 pawn. So knight bd7 and g4, threatening g5, so h6, and now Kamsky castled long, which again prevents black from playing the liberating move d5. So Gelfand played rook c8 instead, which takes control of the semi-open c-file, which is one of black's strong assets in the Sicilian. And now came the unexpected knight d5 from Kamsky, and although this occupies the outpost square, Gelfand is now able to exchange and force Kamsky to recapture with his pawn, which is far less of a problem than a piece planted in d the d5 square. However, this does have the benefit of gaining the bishop pair for white, which must have been Kamsky's idea, as there's little else gained from the move. And there's no knight takes d5 here, of course, or black's light square bishop will be trapped after e takes d5. So bishop takes d5, e takes d5, and now knight b6, which is targeting Kamsky's d-pawn, and Kamsky can take it, <coughs> excuse me, but this would give up the bishop pair, so it's undesirable. White now wants to open the game up as quickly as possible, especially on the king's side, so Kamsky played h4, preparing g5 and king's side initiative. Gelfand answered with queen c7, which is just threatening mate on c2, and prompts Kamsky to play c3. 
and Fritz is starting to like black a lot in this position giving a decent edge of over half a pawn thanks mostly to the pressure on d5 pawn which he is now able to win and Gelfan did so with knight b takes d5 which gives himself two central pawns against none which is um, you know a certain advantage and Kamsky of course was willing to sacrifice this pawn in order to try and gain initiative but first he has to preserve his bishop pair because the bishop here is attacked so he played uh, bishop d2 playing instead rook takes d5 favors black even more after queen c6 which is pinning the rook because if it moves then the white queen is falling so this forces bishop g2 but now comes e4 which interrupts the lines of communication between the queen and the rook and forces queen f5 to defend it but now g6 forces once more rook takes d6 where there's no uh, queen takes d6 or the c8 rook is hanging and no bishop takes d6 or queen takes f6 is very strong for white and best play is simply g takes f5 rook takes c6 rook takes c6 where black has a big advantage the exchange up and a fairly active position so uh, bishop d2 is what Kamsky played and Gelfin retreated his knight now which loses time but a pawn has been won in the process so it's not all bad and the opening of the position should favor white in theory with the bishop pair but it's hard not to like the black position here and if the kingside assault can be defended without losing material black should be in for good endgame chances Kamsky now has a free hand and advanced immediately with g5 so knight f d7 which is to avoid the opening of the h file but this is the second knight retreat in a row which grandmaster knightish watching the game thought was a somewhat passive choice and it's hard not to agree things are opening quite nice quite nicely for white now after g takes h6 which is what Kamsky played but an interesting alternative was g6 with growing pressure on the king side and black is now faced with a difficult decision either he plays rook f8 which loses the ability to castle whilst faced with a position that is going to open quickly or castle into a dangerous attack and f takes g6 is ill-advised especially after queen g4 and advancing the f pawn is very weakening on the light squares especially considering that black has no light square bishop so let's say castles and now white can sacrifice with bishop takes h6 and this makes it very uncomfortable for black and forces very accurate defense to avoid getting mated or losing material for example g takes h6 and now queen h5 with the rook g1 coming next so that was uh, an interesting continuation that um, Kamsky didn't go for instead of playing g takes h6 so g takes h6 from Gelfand and here Kamsky thought for a long time and everyone watching the game was sure he was going to play bishop h3 which takes control of a very nice diagonal and pins the knight at d7 and puts some very serious questions to black about how to defend his position but to our surprise Kamsky played a defensive move himself with king b1 which avoids tactics down the c file and so on but the drawback of this move is that it allows queen c6 which pretty much forces queen h3 which is where the bishop would have liked to go and Gelfand didn't let the chance pass him by and played queen c6 and Kamsky of course wants to avoid the queen exchange after sacrificing a pawn and hoping for an attack so he played queen h3 because from c6 the queen is also attacking the h1 rook but black can now advance in the center so d5 and as in his game against Mamedjarov, Gelfand now has a powerful center whilst his opponent aims for flank play. And the power of the center is of course one of the oldest principles in chess and Gelfand is a renowned positional player. I hadn't looked at his games much before this tournament but he's rapidly becoming a player I enjoy watching. Positional play is far more impressive than tactics in my opinion and Gelfand's defensive abilities in particular are excellent. Kamsky continued here with bishop e2 which is a bit of a slow plan rook g1 or the immediate f4 were looking much better at least according to the grandmasters watching 
I'm not going to have the audacity to question Kamsky's play. But Grandmaster Nightdish thought again here that black was better, despite white having some active play to come, and Fritz agrees. So knight c4, and you know, this is attacking the d2 bishop, and again Kamsky wants to preserve his bishop pair, so he played bishop c1. Next came knight f6, which prepares a later knight e4. And here Kamsky centralized his remaining rook with rook h e1. <coughs> and then came queen e6, which is further centralization and offering a queen exchange to go into a better endgame. A good alternative was playing b5 instead, which bolsters this c4 knight and threatens some kingside initiative and activity against the white king. As before, Kamsky wants to avoid the queen exchange and so he played queen h2, which isn't a great move to have to play, but it emphasizes the disadvantages of having sacrificed a pawn. Gelfand is now able to gain ground due to the fact that a queen exchange would favor him, being the pawn ahead. Now he can give a check, and he did so with queen f5. And after king a1, Gelfand now had 22 minutes for 16 moves, so the pressure was on, although Kamsky's clock wasn't that far behind. Gelfand now played the defensive king f8, which is getting out the si line of sight of the e1 rook, which never hurts to do. Kamsky is in no rush to break through. Playing f4 here, for example, fatally weakens the e4 square, you know, I mean, it always does, and the e4 square would be perfect for the f6 knight. So Kamsky went for prophylaxis instead with f3. And, you know, as in his game against Topolov in the first round, he prefers to maintain the tension for as long as possible before taking decisive action. It's an interesting psychological approach I hadn't given much thought to previously. Gelfand further solidified his center now with the bishop d6, which is eyeing the queen at h2, which Kamsky took action against with queen g1. But this is another quiet move, and had the grandmasters watching quite puzzled, Presumably the thinking behind it was again to add to the pressure on Gelfand instead of aiming for the immediate breakthrough. Bishop b8 is what Gelfand played next, which is finally an inferior move from Gelfand, which is what Kamsky had been waiting for. And, you know, he had time on his side as well, and he found the right move with bishop d3. And this gives Black some serious calculating to do. And to Kamsky's luck, Gelfand now went wrong with queen h5. But even with best play, it was becoming very tricky. According to the engines, d7 was the correct square for the queen. But White would be getting a strong attack with a better position and total compensation for the pawn. We can have a quick look. If queen d7, now bishop takes c4 and rook takes c4 is forced because the d-pawn is pinned and uh, now comes knight a5 which attacks the rook and allows black to win a second pawn with the best move rook takes h4 but now comes queen b6 attacking the f6 knight so queen e7 but now knight takes b7 is playable winning back one of the pawns and giving black some problems the threat of bishop e3 to c5 obliges um, black to aim for a queen exchange or at least to get the queen off the dark diagonal with queen e6 but this allows queen c5 check and after queen e7 queen c6 best play goes rook c4 and queen takes a6 which restores material equality but white is going to have a lot of play and chances for the remainder of the middle game, not to mention connected pass pawns on the queen side for the end game. So it's definitely good and preferable to games that follow with best play after Gelfand's queen h5 here. Okay, that's the end of part one.